Sure, it's good to see everybody this evening. Uh, for those of you who don't, I think I know most of people here, but if those of you who don't know me, my name is Brent Benoit. I am from uh, Baytown, Texas, and uh, tickled pink to be here. We have been looking forward to this for quite some time, Christy and I. It is quite an honor and quite a privilege to be able to come and to uh, just be with you guys for a few days. I'm really sorry that I missed Brother Jay's sermons. I did get to listen to a part of them on, on the YouTube stream, and so I've, I know what everybody's told me is true, which is I've got really big shoes to fill, and I can't fill them, so I'm going to do something dumb tonight and follow Jay Lloyd. I'm going to do another dumb thing, and I'm going to talk about government, so I'm going to see if I can get run out of town in about 24 hours, uh, but hopefully that won't happen. Uh, the, the congregation or the leadership has asked that there be a sermon on the topic of abortion. And I intend to give that topic or give that sermon tomorrow night, Lord willing. But before we get to the topic of abortion, I thought this topic was something that would be worthy of covering, especially in the society that we live in. Now, I'm also going to apologize to some of you who have heard this sermon before because I did give this a few years ago at the Brotherhood meeting. And so if you've heard it before and and uh, are upset about that, I apologize. But if you're like, if you're anything like me, uh, I need a reminder about these things a lot. And so hopefully it'll be helpful to you as we talk about this topic tonight. This is a very important topic. And the reason I think this topic is so important is because of the world that we live, we live in today. We live in a world where morality is rapidly declining all around us. We see that. We lament it. Almost on a daily basis, as we look and we observe out in the world today, what is going on around us. And as we look at government, we see governmental actions oftentimes that allows or sometimes even promotes conduct that is inconsistent with biblical teaching. And as we look at a society where morality is decaying, and we look at a governmental system that either aids or abets that moral decay, then it's quite natural oftentimes for us to look for Christian influence because the, the discourse has become very crass. I don't know if you've turned on the TV. I hope you haven't. But if you've turned on the TV and you've listened for a moment to I don't care which side you're looking at, it is a, a very ugly scene in the political world today. And I don't care which side you're talking about. Both sides are ugly to each other. We no longer talk in reasonable tones. We talk often in shouting. And if you want an example of that, just look at any, any of the footage from the protest after the Dobbs decision that overruled Roe versus Wade. And you'll see exactly how reasonable we are in this world today. We're not very reasonable. It's become very crass. And so all of this makes it very tempting for us to try and find a role for the church to play in government. Because we come from the kingdom of God. And Brother Jay talked about being, you know, of, you know, not of the world but being of the Bible or of the book. And whenever we have our motives driven from the Bible and we look at biblical things, it's quite natural for us to think, you know, there's a lot that we could do to improve our governmental situation. Maybe we could help in that way. And so that's been what a lot of folks have thought, that the church ought to have a role and that Christians ought to have a big role as members of the church in government. And I want to just explore that topic with you a little bit this evening. So the intent of this study, look, I get it's a controversial subject. That's why I'm a little worried that, you know, we may never get to tomorrow night's lesson because y'all may cancel me after today. I hope not. We're going to try and be biblical with this. Uh, but I, I understand it's a controversial subject. I get that. And I'll try and be as non-controversial as I can. There are passionate arguments in the church made on both sides of this argument. There are people in the brotherhood who feel very strongly that there is a role for the church to play in government, and there are others who feel very strongly that there really isn't. And so I get not only is politics controversial, but the role of the church in politics is controversial. I, I get that too. And the intent of this study is really just to identify biblical principles that we should consider before we start talking about church involvement in government and that should govern an individual Christian whenever they're considering getting involved in government. 
And so that's the point of the, of the study tonight. I hope it'll be beneficial to you. Like I said, I need the reminder. I don't know how much you know about my background, but I'm a lawyer by trade, so that's another reason I'll get run out of town. Um, but in any event, I'm a lawyer, and as a result of that, I tend to deal with the government quite a bit. And so I, I understand a lot of times how we really want to try and make a change. I mean, that's the whole reason I became a lawyer is to try and, you know, try and be a positive influence and try and, and do something in the judicial system that would be good. But, you know, there are biblical principles that go along with this, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. So an overview of what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about what the Bible says and what it does not say, and that's important, about how we should interact with government. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk about whether there are scriptural reasons that the church should consider abstaining from political involvement. We'll explore that topic. We'll talk about whether uh, political involvement by the church is an effective method of carrying out our mission. Because I think there's a healthy discussion and study that we can do around that topic. And then finally, we'll touch on what can and should the individual Christian do about political participation. What, what, what would be some considerations that an individual Christian should have in thinking about this topic. So as we begin, I want to make some observations about politics in the church. You know, no political party, and this is important, no political party has yet made the Bible its political platform. Now, look, I know we've all got our favorites, but I don't care which political party you choose, whether it's the Democrat, the Republican, the Libertarian, if we've got some socialist or communist here tonight, great. But no party has ever made the Bible its political platform. That just has not happened. Every political party that you can identify, if you go and look at its political platform, it will deviate in some way from biblical principles. There are positions advanced by both of the major parties and other parties that are consistent with Scripture. That's true. And there are positions that are advanced by both parties that are inconsistent with Scripture. And, you know, it's just the way it is. That's just the way it is sometimes. And we need to understand that and be honest about that. There are Republicans and Democrats in the church. I know some of both. Maybe you think there's only people like you, whatever that stripe may be, but that's not the way it is. We have both in the church. We even have libertarians and supporters of other parties in the church. And so in the kingdom of God, where we have people who have different political beliefs, the question is, what should be the common denominator for us? It Should it be the way of the world where we can't talk to anybody who's not the political stripe that we are? Well, that's going to cause a lot of disunion in the body of Christ. Or should we elevate biblical principles over political principles? Now listen, I don't want to be understood tonight to tell you that your politics don't matter or that there's there's nothing worthy about trying to make the world a better place. That is not what we're talking about tonight. What we're talking about is the role of the church as the role of the kingdom of God, as individual congregations worshiping or as Christians espousing to be doing the work of God, whether the working in government is a place that we ought to be. That's what I'm talking about tonight. So if you are, 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 are really active politically and, and you really have strong beliefs, you know, God bless you. That's great. It's important. We'll talk about that. It's important for us to be involved as participants in our democracy. But we're talking about something a little different tonight, actual formal participation by the church in these things. Now, let's talk about what the Bible says about government. The first thing we're going to start with is probably one of the most obvious verses about this. Romans 13 and verse number 1 Governments are ordained of God. The Bible there says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed of God. You know, we read that sometimes, and I think we kind of let that kind of go in one ear and out the other. And I want us to really let that roll around and think about that tonight. Whatever the authorities are that are in the world today, those authorities and those structures are set up and appointed by God. That's what the Bible says. Now, maybe you love or hate the current, I hope you don't hate, love or dislike the current president. Maybe you loved or disliked the former president. But folks, no matter how we feel about these things, we need to understand that God's word says that he is out there and he plays a role in setting governments up. And we need to, that's why we need to have respect for the government, no matter who is in power. Because God ultimately is in control of these things. The Bible says that. The Bible also indicates that governments are set up for his purpose. Later in the, cha- in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 13, a little later, it says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. 
Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have pra uh, praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is in God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to taxes are due, customs to customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so the Bible says that the reason God sets up these governments is because they are his ministers to accomplish purposes. Now, does that mean that all of the rulers of the world are, you know, uh, you know, wonderful, you know, members of the kingdom? No, it doesn't mean that. God used Pharaoh to accomplish some purposes. Pharaoh was no friend of God's people. And so we can go and you can think about all the historical examples you want of, of really terrible leaders. But the point is, God's plan, which you and I cannot see and cannot devise and cannot edit, God's plan includes a role for these governments. And we need to understand that because God's word says that. God, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse number 13 through 17, the Bible there says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those who do good, for this is, listen, the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish man, as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, Fear God, listen, honor the king. So as Christians, we are called to have honor and respect for our government because it's the will of God. It was something that was put in place by God for a particular purpose. Now, because governments are ordained of our God, our duty is to be in subjection to them. It's not just that we need to give them honor and not say anything bad about it. But as Christians, we are, we are under an obligation to be in subjection to our governments. In Romans chapter 13 and verse number 2, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Titus 3 verse 1 says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. So it's not just that we need to acknowledge, okay, yeah, I'm not going to be ugly about this president or that president or that senator or this representative, but really it's about not only honoring them, but also being in subjection to them as Christians. And we need to understand that as well, because that's God's will. Now, we're also supposed to pay taxes. I won't belabor this because you know this is the story of Jesus. And he eventually says there when they ask him who they, who they should pay tribute to, he asks who the image is on the coin. They said Caesar. And he says, render unto Caesar, unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And sometimes this is a touchy subject for us. It's the government taking money out of our pocket. And I know there's a lot of people here who probably are not fans. of. If you're a fan of taxes, I'd love to talk to you after church. I'm guessing there's not too many people that are. But you know what? As Christians, one of the things we have to do is pay taxes. That's just the way it is. And so we need to understand that and be in subjection to that. Now, some people say, well, what about disobedience? Because there's never a, a time whenever we can disobey. And there are examples in the Bible where Christians disobeyed the government. But the principle that's laid down there is that disobedience of the government is proper only when the government directly impinges on our ability to fulfill our Christian duties. That's the only example in the Bible that we have. In Acts chapter 4 and verses 19 through 20 is an example. It says there, But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. What was the context? The context was that the rulers had gone to Peter and John and said, Don't preach Jesus anymore. And when that happened, they said, well, now we've got a problem because now we've got, you're impinging directly on what we have to do as Christians. We've got to obey God when there's a true contradiction. Brother Trevor this morning in his talk talked about what a contradiction is. A contradiction is not just something that, you know, you're uncomfortable with. A contradiction is something that both things can't happen at the same time. And Peter and John could not not preach Jesus and preach Jesus at the same time. And so whenever that contradiction occurred, they decided that they needed to obey God rather than the government. And that is true. When the government directly impinges on our ability to act, then we need to disobey. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. And that is true. That is a biblical principle that we find in the Bible. 
But let me tell you something. This scriptural license to disobey government is only found when our ability to act is directly frustrated. And that's true. And there are many things that don't fall into this. Sometimes we look at them and go, okay, that's, that's a big exception that I can drive a truck through. No, it's not. Because this does not include our general disagreement with the government. Well, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican and the other side's in power and I disagree and they're doing bad things for the country, so I'm going to disobey. No, there is no scriptural license for that. Only whenever we are directly impinged in our Christian action. Our belief that the government is operating unjustly. I don't like what they did. I don't like the law they passed. I may agree with you. But that does not give us license to be disobedient. God says be subject to them. Our belief that the government is conducive to moral decay. We talked about that at the beginning of our sermon. And that is certainly true. I believe that. But that does not give us license to disobey the government. Or our belief that the government is hostile to Christianity. This it gets bandied about quite a bit that we've got governments that are hostile to Christianity. And, and sometimes I think that might be a little overblown in some areas, not overblown in others. But let me tell you something. The government certainly to some degree is hostile to Christianity because the world is hostile to Christianity. So it's certainly true. But again, that doesn't mean that you and I can conduct, you know, a revolution against the government. The Bible doesn't give us that kind of authority. I want you to think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know that story. They were, you know, ordered to worship an an idol, and they refused. And in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter, for if, if that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us up from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Another example where a Christian, well, in this case, the Jews, the Jewish, uh, 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 the Jewish men there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were directly, were told to do something directly against God's word, and they said, "We're not going to do that," and that's true, and they did that. But I want you to know, ironically, after they did that, they were delivered from the fiery furnace, and they were promoted in their governmental roles. So God did protect them as they went through that. But you know, even whenever we have this scriptural license to disobey. We should do that still in the spirit of submission. We need to do it with respect, with honor, and with dignity that God calls us to. Not screaming where, you know, spittle is flying out of our mouth and, you know, we've, you know, we're in camouflage and, you know, carrying guns and threatening to overturn the, I mean, folks, that's just not what Christians do. It's just not. I listened to what Daniel did. Remember when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den? I don't, know what's ha- I don't know what the government has done to you lately. I mean, I know the government's done a lot to a lot of people. But, you know, as bad as the government has been sometimes to me, whether that's taxes or laws I don't like or whatever, you know what nobody's ever, nobody's ever come to me and thrown me in a den of lions. Has that ever happened to you? Has the government been that bad to you? It was that bad to Daniel. Daniel's sitting in a den of lions. And the king comes, and Daniel, of course, as we know, through the protection of God, is sat in that lion's den all night and did not get eaten by lions. The king comes and says, hey, Daniel, how are you doing? Because he wanted to see whether Daniel was alive. Now, if that would have been me or you, what would have been your first statement to the king? How would you have reacted? Would you have been a little upset that you'd been thrown in a lion? I bet you would have been a little upset. Listen to what Daniel said. O king, live forever. That's how he starts addressing the king. You see, Daniel was going to disobey. That's why he was in the lion's den. But he never lost his spirit of respect and humility and submission. And you know what? That impacted the king. And the Bible records that. Folks, we can be a powerful witness for God whenever you and I learn to do things with, with dignity and with submission and with respect. Because the world is not that way. The world yells. The world screams. The world wants all kinds of revenge. And folks, that is not a good look for Christianity. It's not a place we need to be. We are to pray for government and governmental leaders. The Bible tells us that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the first three verses. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that they may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for that is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So we're instructed to pray for these. And that means all governmental leaders, not the ones you like, not the ones you voted for last time you went into the ballot box, everyone. So Republicans, I got a bad news for you. You need to pray for Democrats, even President Biden and Vice President Harris. I don't care how you feel about them. 
And let me tell you something, Democrats, you need to pray for Republicans. And yeah, that means Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis too. And name all the others that you don't like. Folks, we need to pray for our leaders. The Bible tells us that to the extent that these folks are leaders. Now, here's what the Bible does not say about government. There is not a single New Testament example of involvement by the church in politics. That's just the truth. Jesus never went and tried to get some legislative proposal passed while he was on the earth, nor did his apostles. There is not a single New Testament example of the church advocating some change in the form of government. You don't see Jesus walking around saying, hey, this, this Roman Empire thing we've got going on here, we need to overthrow it. That, that just doesn't get said. There's just not a single example of that. If, if anything, there was a misperception about Jesus on this point. People un, incorrectly thought that that's what he wanted to do. And Jesus had to disabuse them of that notion. There is not a single New Testament example of the church advocating some change in any particular law. Nobody ever does that in the New Testament. And there's not a single New Testament example of the church attempting to accomplish any improvement in general morality through political means. Sure, the church tried to improve morality through a lot of things, but not through politics. We just have no example of that when we look at the New Testament Scripture. Now, I want you, you know, a lot of times whenever I have this discussion and, you know, you talk to people about this topic, one of the things that inevitably comes up is they go, like, I, I know we're supposed to respect our leaders, and, and I know we're supposed to pray for our leaders, but, but have you seen our leaders? And then they want to go on this parade of horribles about how bad our leaders are today. And look, there's a lot of bad ones out there on both sides of the aisle. I don't deny that. But I want you to remember the context in which the New Testament Scripture was written. They were not blessed with the relatively mild case of rancor that we've got between Democrats and Republicans in this country today. They had a little bit of a different governmental system that looked over them. This governmental system demanded emperor worship. Not, you could not worship Christ. You had to worship Caesar. And if you didn't worship Caesar, there were consequences that were going to be paid. You might not be able to practice your trade. You might be persecuted. You might even be put to death in front of your family if you were not willing to worship Caesar. Does that sound like your government today? There were Christian persecution. That it was a governmental system where there was pervasive slavery that existed throughout the government. There was, they had infant exposure as a practice back then. Whenever kids were born that they didn't want, what they would do is they would go and they would sit the baby out and let it die of exposure. We'll talk more about this kind of topic tomorrow night, but a horrible practice. It was a government that sanctioned killing for entertainment. They built arenas to watch people die by government decree at the pleasure of the Caesar, like it was the Super Bowl or something like that. And people had entertainment value from that. That was the government that they were involved in. It, there was institutionalized prostitution as a result of this government. And there were deviant sexual practices by both the government leaders and so-called religious institutions at the time. Now, that is the government that was in power whenever those words were written. Pray for your leaders. Honor the king. Submit to the government. And sometimes we, you know, it's like anything else. Sometimes we think we've got it bad because everything starts with us and it's kind of our selfish way of looking at the world. Sometimes we look at it only through our lens and we go, yeah, but if God would have known the situation and look at all the things that are going wrong in our country, folks, I know there's a lot of things going wrong in our country, but it's not that bad yet. We don't have some of those. I know we got bad things and I know you could rattle off a list as long as your arm. I get it. But folks, that was a bad government. And despite we, the fact that there was a tyrant walking around saying, if you practice your religion, I may put you to death, still the apostle was writing, honor the king. Submit. Make sure that you follow your government leaders. Pray for them because they're God's ministers. Now you may say, but Brent, that makes no sense. It doesn't have to make sense. It's the word of God. You and I need to submit. If we're going to submit to anybody, for sure, we need to submit to God. And God says that's what he wants us to do. And so we need to understand that and think about that. Yet, we see no examples, despite all this stuff going on. You would have thought, wow. And they had Christ walking around with them. If there was ever a time to get a really fantastic political rally for the church going, whenever you've got that kind of government and you've got Jesus Christ walking on the earth, do you think maybe that would have got organized? 
Do you think maybe Jesus, with, with the example that he lived and with the powers that he had, could have done something fantastic in politics? He probably could have. Not probably, he would have. But yet we don't see that in the New Testament. Now, what do I mean by political involvement by the church? What, what are we talking about here? I'm not talking about, like I said, supporting somebody that you believe would be a good candidate. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is sometimes we have sermons that support a particular political position. We need to be careful about that. We do. We need to give our, our sermons need to reflect biblical principles. But sometimes we let those things conflate and blur in our minds sometimes. And we get to talking and before too long we're, we're trying to advocate a particular policy or a particular law. Folks, that's just not what the church is for. Talk about the biblical principle. Don't talk about the particular political position. Let me tell you something, if you talk about politics, it's one of the reasons I told you I might get run out of town. You talk about politics, there is a, I mean, I, I get it. Some of you, you know, maybe going, man, I don't know about this. All I can tell you is submit you to the word of God and ask that you, you consider some of the scripture we're looking at tonight. But let me tell you something, when we get into the realm of politics, there is a fair chance we're going to offend somebody. So you may feel really special about your political position, but you get up and preach it from the pulpit, you may alienate some people. And maybe that's one of the reasons that God doesn't want this in his church. Church solicitation or encouragement of support for political groups, sometimes that happens. We need to watch out for that. Church sponsorship or invitation of political speech. We, see, we don't see that so much in our brotherhood, I don't think. I don't really recall any, but boy, you can turn on the TVs and whenever it's election time, uh, all our political candidates turn into avid church attenders. There, you see them at all kinds of religious assemblies, talking to all kinds of religious groups. And those religious groups invite them, want to have them to be able to talk about their policies. Church organization of grassroots political movements. These are things that we need to be very careful about when we think about church involvement. Now, there are scriptural reasons that we should really think about church involvement in politics. And I want to talk about a couple of those with you. The church should not be preoccupied with fixing the world because we are not of this world. We've talked about that. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus said, if I was concerned about politics and about winning a political debate, then my servants would fight. We would revolt. We would overthrow this government. We would install me as king. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's not about this world. Whenever you and I run to politics, we are trying to solve something that is not solvable. We think by our own, you know, wonderful genius and our own intellect that we are going to somehow legislate this world to no longer be broken. You can't do that. It's broken by sin. It's just broken. And we are looking for a better place, the Bible talks about. That's why Jesus said, I'm not interested in ruling this place. This place is not a place I want to hang out in. It's broken. I'm here to take people to a better place, which is why he said my kingdom's not of this world. Politics also is not the weapon that we are chosen, we are told to use in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, mighty, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now I want you to listen to that last phrase, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know what our political weapon is? It's not to go get out the vote or to register a bunch of voters that happen to believe what we want to believe or, or petition our representatives or senators for a better law. That's not the weapon we're supposed to use. We're supposed to change hearts, not laws. We're supposed to convert people's souls, not their ballot. And too many times we get those issues confused and we think, well, you know, if I can make a good such and such out of somebody, maybe I've gone some way to make them a better moral person. No, you haven't. You want to make them a better person, make them a Christian. And don't care what political position they take. Care about what biblical position they take. The rest will fall in line once we start letting Christ rule our life. The primary goal of the church, as I've said, is conversion, not legislation. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 8, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
See, what, what we're called to is not to support some political agenda, but we are called into the light of Christ and to support the, 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 the biblical principles that we all love that flow from the Word of God. That's really what our focus should be. Our true citizenship, we get this confused sometimes, is heaven. I know we're all proud to be Americans. And I know, I think most of the people here are proud to be Texans. Some of you are misguided Arkansas and Oklahoma people, but that's okay. No, I mean, I know we're all proud of where we're from, and that's good. And we're all proud to be Americans, and that's great. But folks, that's not our real citizenship. Those things are very temporary. Very temporary. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our citizenship is. And too many times we get that wrong. We, we get so consumed by this world that we think that it's about how this nation goes or it's about how our state goes or how our county goes. And folks, it's temporary. It's temporary. It's not going to last. It's just not. And you and I can try and change it until we die, but it's not going to last. We're not going to accomplish anything lasting we are called to be ambassadors, not legislators. I think this is kind of an important topic. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse number 20, it says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Most of you, I'm sure probably all of you know what an ambassador is. We have ambassadors to other nations. We have an ambassador to China. We have an ambassador to Mexico. We have an ambassador to Brazil. And name your favorite country. We have ambassadors to most of those unless we don't have diplomatic relations with them. Have you ever seen one of our ambassadors saunter up to the, to, the, to, the, to the dais over in some legislature that it's at? What if our ambassador to China stro you know, kind of strode into the Politburo and says, I'm the ambassador from the United States and I would like to propose some changes in the law. How do you think that would go over? That would not go over so good. Why? They're not Chinese legislators. They're ambassadors. They're there to represent the United States, not change China. That's what an ambassador does. It represents a foreign country. You are representing a foreign country. You're not here. You're, you're, you're here temporarily. You're a sojourner. You're a traveler. But we're not here to, to try and legislate America. We're here to represent our kingdom, which is the kingdom of God, and try and be a good representative of it while we walk here. But too many times, instead of wanting to be ambassadors for Christ, we want to be legislators for Christ. There's no such thing as that in the Bible. It just doesn't talk about it. I think we need to think about whether politics will effectively address the mission of the church. Let's talk about whether that's even just a good idea in general. Is that an effective way for us to accomplish our mission? You know, what is the mission of the church, I think we can all agree, is to save souls. That's really the fundamental mission of the kingdom of God on this earth. In Matthew chapter 28 and 18 through 20, it's the Great Commission. Jesus answered, came and spake unto them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, changing every law that you can possibly find, finding as many ballots as you can possibly find, making sure people are registered to vote, and lo, I'm with you always into the end of the world. That's not what that says. None of that politics stuff is in there. The only mission we've got is to save souls and to baptize people and to make disciples out of people. That's our mission. In Mark 16, 15 through 16, similar uh, uh, account of the Great Commission. You all are familiar with that passage. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, we just read it. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are to proclaim, proclaim Christ Excuse me, when we're on this earth. That's our mission. Now, political action and legislation cannot accomplish this mission. It'd be great. You know, if we could legislate to, to a, a law that says everybody has to have a, a pure heart before God, and we're going to pass that in the, in the Congress, and we're going to have it approved by the Senate, and then the president's going to sign that, and that could work, that'd be wonderful. But that's not how it works. You and I can legislate till the cows come home, as they say, but that's not going to change any hearts. Even, even the recent decision, the abortion decision that came out a few weeks ago, did you see the protest? Do you think that changed any hearts just because some judge decided something? Do you think it changed people who feel strongly about that? It didn't. What will? The Word of God. The Word of God will. And that's why we need to be focused on that. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 37, Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. That's where our focus needs to be. 
Not, not on prescribing or, prescri or, or setting limits on people's daily activity. I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm talking about what the focus of the church should be. The focus of the church should be on hearts and souls and minds. And none of those are affected by legislation. All of those are affected profoundly by the Word of God. And so if we're placing our chips here on where we need to put our activity and our efforts, folks, it's not politics, it's not the government, it's the Word of God. Because it's the only thing that will change what is really the problem. With politics, we are fighting a losing battle against the symptoms. That's all we're doing. We have no cure. The cure is God's Word. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. It is a condition of the heart that we seek to affect in this world. Matthew 5, 15 and 8, Jesus says, their heart is far from me. You know, political, I'm sorry, that's a little small, but political action and legislation has not proven to be particularly effective in proving morality. And I've got a couple of examples up there. We've got laws for, against things. For example, we've got laws against, uh, we used to have a law against uh, alcohol. We had a prohibition law. And that didn't go over so well. What that created was a bunch of speakeasies where people went underground. And we, we also probably helped to really bring into America the mafia because of prohibition and their ability to kind of, you know, kind of satisfy the latent need there. You know what would have changed people from not drinking and being drunk? The Word of God. You know what didn't change them from doing that? Prohibition. All it did was drive them underground. We have drug laws. We have drug problems. We have prostitution laws. We have prostitution problems. I could go on and on and on. We have laws against things, but those things are not particularly effective at stopping it. And this does not mean these laws are bad ideas. It does not mean that you and I should not support them. That's not what I'm saying. They are just not particularly effective at the end of the day, especially in accomplishing anything related to spirituality. And another thing about political action legislation is that it can be reversed. You may win a battle and then lose it almost immediately. That's what happens in politics. There was a bill called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that was passed in 1993, and it was held unconstitutional in 1997. That was a good four-year run. That's it. It's dead. Indiana's version of the law was eventually watered down and amended, and versions in other states are now under intense attack because the states tried to do it, and it didn't work either. We had sodomy laws that were declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court. That still stands today. We had laws criminalizing marijuana that have been, that have been repealed in most Western states and, and many states today. You think you won, you know, we won a great battle against drugs by, by criminalizing marijuana. Well, that got reversed because laws can be reversed. And even though there has been this decision in Dobbs to overrule Roe versus Wade, if you have read a stitch of newspapers since then, you know that there are efforts already underway to restore Roe versus Wade. And folks, that's going to be the case. Political action is not stable. It can be reversed. But you know what is stable? A converted soul. You may win a legislative battle, and if you lose the next election, you may see your, your piece of legislation overruled immediately. But let me tell you something. If you convert someone to Christ, Satan can't touch that. In John chapter 10 and verse 28, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. You convert a soul to Christ, there is no law, there is no compulsory act that is going to snatch their heart away from Christ. The only thing that is going to move them from Christ is themselves. But they are untouchable. You, today who are Christians, are untouchable unless you say that you can be touched. But that's not the case with the government. The government, as we all know, can reach out and touch us at any moment depending on how the political winds are blowing. Romans 8, 38 through 39, for I am persuaded that neither, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is certain once you and I are converted to Christ, unless we walk away. What about individual Christians? You say, okay, I get it. Maybe it's not such a good idea. I hope maybe you think that. Maybe it's not such a good idea for the church to take place organized in government. What about individual Christians? 
There is no scriptural prohibition on individual participation in the political process. I want to be clear about that. The Bible doesn't prescribe us from doing that. As a matter of fact, we can see several examples in the Bible of people who did work from the government. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Erastus was a treasurer. The Ethiopian eunuch worked for the government at that time. Cornelius was a centurion, and we could go on and on. There are people who work for the government. So I think Jeffrey's here tonight. He's the, he's the tax assessor collector. I mean, he's probably really popular right now. Uh, you know, so it's okay for him to do that. The Bible says there are people who work for the government. There's no prohibition on that. In fact, because we are a democracy, Respect for the government at some level compels us that we at least participate in that democracy. I mean, if we are supposed to respect our government, our government is a democracy, and that means that you and I should participate by voting in it and expressing our preferences. That's perfectly okay. But, you know, sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes merely doing our civic duty and, and voting is, is people want more. There are some that desire to be involved in the political process in a much more active and substantial way. And again, there's no scriptural prohibition on individuals' participation to that degree in the political process. There's nothing that says you can't run for mayor or, or representative or congressman or senator or, you know, maybe we've got some future presidents here in the audience today. There's nothing that says you can't do that. But whether that's proper, I would suggest to you, probably depends on two things, your motive and your priority. It's not that these things are bad. We just need to put them in the right place. Political participation cannot be based on bad motives, and sometimes it is. We have to be honest about our, with ourselves about why it is that we desire to be involved politically. What are some good motives? Maybe you want to be involved in politics because you have a sincere and genuine desire to protect and help our fellow man. That'd be a good motive. Maybe you've got a sincere and, and genuine desire to improve our nation. That'd be a good motive. Maybe you desire, even though you're not going to call for uh, organized religion to set and have a political example, maybe you still think there is some good that a Christian influence in government could do. That'd be, that'd be a good political, a good motive for being involved. But you know, there's some other bad ones too. I know, I know nobody believes this, but sometimes politicians run for prestige. It's really not about any genuine, it's about, hey, look, I'm now a senator, look at me. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes they run because they just like power. They just love it. It's why they run so hard and then they run so hard to stay there. They just love the power. It's addictive. They also have selfish goals sometimes. Sometimes they want to be in, 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 on, in, in a position of power because they'll do something that benefits themselves or, or some group that they are affini- uh, have an affinity to. Matthew 5 and 5, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 23 and 12, whosoever exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. We cannot be proud and boastful people. 1 Corinthians 10 and 24, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. In Philippians 2 and 4, let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And like I can't, nobody can answer this question for anybody. If you're considering running for office or being really involved in politics, you just got to have an honest moment with yourself where you ask, why am I doing this? What am I trying to accomplish? And look, if you've got good, genuine motives, then, then go get involved and go do it. If that's really what you want to do, do it in a way that honors God. But if you've got motives that are not pure, stay away from it. It'll eat you up. It will eat you up. It'll eat your soul up. You will get consumed with greed and power and prestige and self-aggrandizement, and it will eat your soul up. Don't touch it if that's your motive. We also have to put it in the proper priority. You know, even commanded acts can become wrong when we have them in the wrong priority. You know, for example, we're commanded to earn a living. That's one of the things we're commanded to earn. We're also supposed to provide for our family and be fathers and mothers and all of that. Well, we can get those things out of whack. We've seen that happen. We've seen people who work, you know, 100 hours a week. And you talk to them about, hey, you're never here, you're never there, and, you know, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And the retort is, well, I've got to earn a living for my family. Well, that's true, but it needs to be in the proper priority. The same is true for politics. While political involvement is not wrong in its face, political involvement that consumes us and that detracts from our mission to save souls can become wrong. And too many times we can let politics eat us up. Let me tell you something. When I was at the, uh, whenever I was a young lawyer, I had the opportunity to go be at the Texas Attorney General's office, and I was there when Bush was governor, and he was running for president. And I was working for, at that time, the Attorney General of Texas, who was John Cornyn, who's now our senator, John Cornyn. And so it was a real neat time to be in Austin because we had 
a governor who was obviously just down the hall from us who was running for president. And everywhere we went, there were cameras and news reporters and all that. I can't tell you how much time I spent on Fox News watching that race. You know what I found out? It was beginning to eat me up. I was beginning to spend all my time really worried and concerned about politics. You know, I've gotten to the point now where I really don't turn on the news anymore. I got to tell you, it's pretty liberating. Sometimes people say, did you see this or you see that? And I go, I, I really didn't. And I'm kind of glad sometimes. And it's not that I don't care. Look, I'll, you know, if you want to know my political beliefs, I, I will try and hide them from you. But, but I will tell you, I'll, I'll also probably tell them to you. But my, because I'm just that way. But the point is, we may all have our political beliefs, but we got to put them in the right priority. And we, got, we can't let it eat us up. Matthew 6 and 19 through 21, do not lay for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasury is, there will your heart be also. Where's your heart? If, if being involved in the political process is I want to make a name for myself, people are going to remember Brent Benoit, the great mayor of Baytown. Nobody does that. But I just say that that was going to be something that was really going to be some big deal. Let me tell you something. That is putting your treasure on this earth. Because whenever you get to the day of judgment, you can be a senator or a representative or a Supreme Court justice or the president, and it will matter zero, zero on the day of judgment. I'm not telling you it'll be plus or minus, but I'm telling you it'll be zero. What's going to count is are you saved by Christ? Are you covered with the blood of Christ? Are you a member of God's kingdom? That's what's going to matter. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, if you, then were raised with, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. And folks, when we get consumed by politics in this world, our mind's not on heaven. It's just not. Our mind's on this earth. And we need to be honest with ourselves and understand that. And look, I'm, I'm up here confessing I'm guilty as you guys are. So sometimes, and I'm, we all are. I'm not calling you guys guilty, but... If you're human, you're like me, and you get wrapped up in this stuff sometimes. And we need to set our affections on things above. Some, somebody says, well, you know, but, but this persecution thing. You know, I mean, they're doing stuff that really is not, it's, it's anti-Christian. I get that. But you know what? The Bible doesn't say if you're persecuted, go take a whack at them and try and kill them or do something to them. That's not what the Bible says. That's not our response to persecution. Persecution is not something that we fight back violently against. Persecution is something that we handle and we endure for Christ's sake. And by doing that, we set a good example. That's what we do. We are told that we will be persecuted. Folks, if you're not being persecuted, something's wrong. Because Jesus said that if we are living a life for Christ, we're going to be persecuted. In John chapter 15, verse number 20, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3 and 12 says that all who desire to live godly in Christ, Jesus will suffer persecution. So we're going to be persecuted. Don't be surprised by that. So then why do we spend so much time trying to avoid it? We act like it's some indignity. We're being persecuted. We've got to make that stop. No. I mean, yes, it's bad to be persecuted, but we were told we were going to be persecuted. You're fighting a losing battle if you're trying to avoid persecution. And maybe we should look at it a little differently. Let me tell you something. The impact that you will have by enduring persecution, folks, that outweighs all of the efforts of trying to avoid it in the first place. And let me give you an example. In Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 31, that's a little small, so I'll try and read this but a little slow. But it's one of my favorite little stories in the Bible. The apostles, some of the apostles had just been beaten for preaching God's word. And it says there, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. 
For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the, Gal with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatsoever your, your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, folks, did you, did you notice that prayer? It did not say, Lord, give us a good lobbyist so we can put this down. They didn't say, Lord, please let there be a lot of signatures on our petition against this prohibition. They did not talk about how to get the Romans to prevent the Jews from discriminating against the Christians. They didn't make a prayer to God to change for government. They didn't do any of those things. That wasn't in any of their prayer. Instead, listen, they prayed for boldness to keep preaching Christ. That's what they prayed for. That was the prayer. And folks, whenever you and I face persecution, the answer is not to get mad and fight and create a ruckus. The answer is to be Christians and to say like Peter and John did in that verse, look, you may not like what we're doing, but we're going to obey God. We're going to do it respectfully. We're going to do it with dignity. We're going to do it with, with, with submission and humility, but we're going to do it. And folks, that sets an example. It sets a tremendous example. Last verse. Now more than ever, we need to make sure that we have the right perspective on persecution. In Acts chapter 5, and they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council. Now listen to this. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. We feel like we have persecution today, and rather than rejoice, we get indignant. We get offended. We try and start plotting revenge. We decide we're going to take out whichever political official just did that to us or passed that law or proposed that program. And folks, what the early church did whenever they were persecuted is they got happy. They rejoiced. They said, you know what? We were counted worthy to suffer persecution. You know what they prayed for? You know what they did? To preach support God's word. Now, again, I don't want to be misunderstood tonight to let you think that, hey, if you've got political beliefs, that's a problem or that's any kind of weakness. It's not. Like I said, we can have our political beliefs. But, folks, we need to put those in the right priority and we need to put them in the right context. We are of the kingdom, not of this world. And too many times we blur that, especially in the line of politics. Let's try and keep those in the right priority. And no matter what happens... Let's be good ambassadors for Christ in this world. Let's set an example of being peaceable, honorable, dignified, God-fearing people that will be attractive to the world. And that's how we change minds. That's how we change hearts. And that's how we change souls. And it will be permanent, not transitory like a law will be. I hope these things have been helpful to you. I hope there's it's a study that you found to be edifying. If nobody else was edified, I was edified by giving it because I need to be reminded of these things. Uh, I think it's a very important topic in the world we live in today. We have a big, big political problem in this world today. The, the discourse has become bad. We can be part of that solution by just not participating in the problem and being good examples. If you're here tonight and you have not yet named the name of Christ, folks, there's nothing more important than converting your soul and your heart and your mind to Christ. We've talked about that. And if you have not yet named the name of Christ, you can do so tonight. It takes believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, being willing to repent of the sins that we've committed, being willing to confess his name before man, and being willing to be baptized for the remission of sins. If you do that, you'll be converted. You'll be saved. And remember those verses we read, no one, nobody will be able to pluck you out of the master's hand. That is a comforting and secure feeling. If you're here and you have not taken those steps, it's time that you do that tonight if you're willing. Or if you need the prayers of the church for any reason, there's one of either case. Won't you please come forward while we stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs>